they, they had to strike the set last night for another program and reset up today, and they got almost 99.9% .9 done, except the podium. Yeah, podium. <laughs> anyway, I just realized that. Hey, welcome, everybody, to the Prophecy Encounter program. Thank you for coming back. Amen. We're so glad you're here, and um, want to welcome our friends that are also watching online, and we, uh, we're going to be dealing with Bible questions first and then give you an opportunity to uh, text them in. How do they do that? All right. If you would like to text a question into our program, please dial 1-760-523-2287. So that's, again, for those of you who would like to text a question into the Prophecy Encounter program, please dial 1-760-523-2287. And we've got some questions that came in. We're going to try to do roughly 10 or 12 questions. We're watching the clock as we do. And uh, we also, uh, we take the liberty to try and match questions. With you. We know certain subjects and topics that are coming. So you might say, I wrote a question. How come they're not dealing with it? Well, we may be waiting until another night when we know the topic's going to be connected with that question. So... With that lengthy introduction, let's see what our oh, first but question is. Before we start, I wanted to tell you guys something. So this afternoon, I came to our room, and I turned on the television, and I looked through the information guide channel, and guess what I saw at 5 o'clock on channel 41, which is the religious channel? I saw Amazing Facts. <laughs> it was really quite fun. So, so I'd like to make another <laughs> commercial. Sunday night, 5 to 6, Channel 41. You can watch Amazing Facts. That's right. She locally. called me in so I could watch myself on TV. That's right. <laughs> There's more to the story, but I'm not allowed to say it. All right. Okay, we'll first right question. There. <laughs> All right, our first question is, will there be seven years of tribulation before Jesus comes? Uh, nowhere in the Bible does it say there's going to be seven years of tribulation. Um, the reason that some people say, well, uh, let me just ask you, can you show me a scripture? I don't know, we got a few hundred people here. Can you show me a scripture that says seven years of tribulation? That's what I'm saying. It's no scripture that says that. Uh, now, I'll, I'll tell you where people get the idea that the tribulation, and there's gonna, everyone agrees there's going to be a tribulation. Some believe it's going to be three and a half years, seven, seven years, and, and various times. Um, one reason is because there were seven days between the time probation closed in the days of Noah and the rain came. Some say, well, there'll be seven years in the future, and they, they extrapolate that somehow. And others take a prophecy that we looked at last night dealing with the 490 years of Daniel chapter 9, and they say that uh, that last week is going to be the seven years of tribulation. But it doesn't really call it that. Um, when we learned last night in the 490-year prophecy, it said he will confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he will cause the sacrifice to cease. Who is the one that caused the sacrifice to cease? Jesus. Are you aware that the left behind folks say that it's the Antichrist that causes the sacrifice to cease? That's a pretty big difference in interpretation. I can't both be right. Um, so... I'd like to ask, where does the Antichrist confirm a covenant with anybody, biblically in prophecy? Christ is the one who made a covenant of salvation. It's called, you got the, you know, the people in the Old Testament are saved in the New Covenant. The first time you find the New Covenant is in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, it says, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And so this covenant is confirmed with the house of Israel. The whole prophecy of Daniel has to do with 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. And so he confirms the covenant with Daniel's people. And in the midst of that last week, the Messiah causes the sacrifice to cease by dying on the cross. The veil is rent in the temple. You see how it all fits together? So some say it's seven years of tribulation. Uh, it you know, doesn't say it's not, but I don't think so. Let me tell you why. There will be a tribulation. The seven, the, the tribulation, the seven last plagues are the tribulation. Revelation 15 and 16. How long did the plagues take that fell on Egypt? Well, it doesn't tell you the exact time, but as you read through Exodus and you look at the ten plagues, they go back to back, and it all seems to happen within a couple of months at the most. 
And how could the world last if you've got seven years of men being scorched with great heat and the ocean is turned to blood and the fresh waters have turned to blood and people are being uh, made miserable by noisome and grievous sores? That's not going to go on for seven years. No flesh would survive. So I think the time period for the last plagues will be similar to the plagues that fell on Egypt. Job's sufferings. Job went through a time of trouble. How long did it last? It was just back to back, very intense, but you know, a matter of a few weeks, he lost everything. And so I'm more inclined to think that it's going to be um, all within a year. Matter of fact, you can read in Revelation, it says, all of thy plagues come within one day. And a day in prophecy is how long? A year. A year. It's something that I think is going to happen in pretty quick order. Revelation 1 7 says that those who pierced Jesus will see him at the second coming. Who are these people? Well, you can read in Daniel chapter 12, it says that uh, Michael will stand up, the great prince, this is verse 1, who stands for the children of thy people. And at that time, thy people will be delivered, everyone that is found written in the book. And uh, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Some people are going to be raised at the end who were participating in the crucifixion of Jesus. If you look, for example, um, the Caiaphas, the high priest, when he said to Christ, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you're the, uh, the Christ. And Jesus said, hereafter, this is Matthew 26, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds on the right hand of glory. And so some people who were participating and the leading culprits and accomplices in the crucifixion who were deriding Christ, they're going to be raised to see who it was that they were treating that way. So that's not the universal resurrection, but some who pierced him, his hands and his feet and his side, uh, the soldiers that mocked him, they may be part of a special resurrection of judgment. Pontius Pilate. Pilate, you know, Pilate was, Jesus said even to Pilate, you've got the lesser sin. He says, you're just trying to, Pilate said, I find no fault in him. He tried to let him go. But yeah, he was guilty. He ultimately condemned him, even though he declared him innocent. All right. What is the abomination of desolation that we read about in Matthew 24, 15? Tell you what, I'll make you a deal. I'll answer that question if someone will bring me my pulpit. <laughs> <laughs> something, something. I don't want to Somebody sit on the piano. Somebody back there, do you have a pulpit? Are you, you can you just stand here while I preach in a sure, little while? Sure, no, not I'll now, but I mean. Okay. <laughs> All right. Question is about the abomination of desolation that you read about in Matthew 24, verse 15. Um, the, you know, the abomination, Jesus said, whoever reads Daniel the prophet, let him understand. So you first hear about the abomination of desolation in Daniel. Daniel's talking about this power that would desolate God's people. And bless their little hearts. Thank you so much. Now I'm happy. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> I like Your to talk pay with my is hands. now increased. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. And so, oh, I can move. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and uh, in, in um, Matthew chapter 24, it talks about, verse 15, the abomination that makes desolate. But you also read in Luke 21, there's a power that desolated God's people. The Roman power... Uh, just totally demolished. Now, during the time of Daniel, Babylon had demolished Israel. Daniel was in captivity in Babylon. Um, but he was looking ahead in prophecy to another power that would demolish and desolate the temple that would be rebuilt. And it is primarily the Roman power because Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, let him that is in Judea flee into the mountains. In Luke it says, when you see uh, Jerusalem encompassed with armies, let him who is in Judea flee into the mountains. And so the first part of the abomination of desolation is when pagan Rome surrounded Jerusalem. Christ actually gave a signal to the Christians to flee the city, and they did. No Christians perished in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. But there's another time coming in the future. The things that Jesus said... In Matthew 24, the signs of his coming you find in Luke 17, Luke 21, they're repeated. They happen to Israel, and then they happen again globally. There's a great time of trouble that came on Israel, and there'll be a great time of trouble that happens globally 
in the last days. We have a lesson coming on who that abominating, desolating power is. So keep coming. All right. Yeah. What does it mean to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ? Well, of course, Jesus is not advocating cannibalism. <laughs> uh, he, he's speaking in terms, because, you know, the Bible says that uh, uh, only animals that have a cloven hoof and chew the cud are clean, and people don't have, some may chew the cud, but they don't have a cloven hoof. <laughs> so uh, it's telling us that um, he said, my flesh is meat indeed, my blood is drink indeed. What happened at the Last Supper? He gave them bread. He said, take, eat, this is my flesh. He gave them grape juice. He said, this is my blood of the covenant. Uh, when you read the Bible, Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. So when we receive Christ in our hearts, when we receive his word in our lives, it is eating his flesh. Drinking his blood is accepting by faith the covenant that forgives our sins. You are washed in the blood. And he's talking about the whole purpose in his coming, his life, flesh and blood. When you receive me into you, you know, Paul said, it's not I that live, but Christ that lives in me. A real Christian gets to the place where you're filled with the spirit of Christ. And he said, the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me. Mm. There's a yeah. song many Christians sing, live out thy life within me, O Jesus, King of kings. Eating his flesh and drinking his blood means inviting him to be inside you through his word, through the Holy Spirit. All yep. right, thank you. Okay. okay. What is the difference between literal Israel and spiritual Israel? Now, you've got to be careful answering this question because uh, as soon as you talk about spiritual Israel, some people think that automatically means you believe in replacement theology. There is, and I'm a Jew, we just came from Israel. We believe that God has a very important role for Israel in history. Um, I don't think God is done with the Jewish people, but at the same time, it's very clear biblically that Christ said, many will come from the east and the west and sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're the Jewish patriarchs. Paul said, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed. You kind of become a spiritual Jew. Paul also says that the Gentiles are like a wild olive branch that is grafted into the stock of of Israel. Uh, John the Baptist said, don't think to say within yourself that we'll be saved because we're children of Abraham. God is able to raise up from these stones children unto Abraham. And so when you accept Christ and you, you accept the covenant in that book, is the new covenant made for Gentiles or Jews? That's it's a question. For, what do you think? It's made for everybody. Let me read it to you. A new covenant I will make after those days with the house of Israel. Do you know there's no covenant of salvation God makes with Gentiles? And the, the reason that you're able to cash in on Jesus is because you are grafted into the stock of Abraham. You become a spiritual Jew. And so it's not that God is getting rid of the Jews. God is inviting the Gentiles to be grafted in. You know, you've got people in the Bible like Ruth. Was Ruth a Moabite? Yes. Yeah. I meant to say, was she a Jew? But I gave you the answer. Thank you. What color was George Washington's white horse? And who's Blue. buried in Grant's tomb? No. <laughs> Ulysses. So Ruth was a Moabitess, but she was grafted in to Israel. Rahab was a Canaanite, but she was grafted in through faith. And so you, when you accept Christ, you are grafted in, and all the promises made in the Bible belong to you Gentiles who become spiritual Jews. So I actually have a book I wrote with Steve Wolberg, another Jewish believer, called Spiritual Israel. You can download it for free at the Amazing Facts website. All right. If I accept Christ and his forgiveness, but then fall again, will he forgive me again? I hope so, or I'm doomed. <laughs> um, how many of you would agree with that? Amen. Now, it's one thing to say that. Can you prove it? Are there examples in the Bible of people who asked God for forgiveness, he forgave them, and then they made mistakes afterward? Yes. Many. I mean, you can look at David. You can look at Moses. You can look at Peter. Peter denied Christ. Jesus forgave him. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And later, Paul has to rebuke Peter for being hypocritical. I'm sure that there's many mistakes. And John said, if any man says that he doesn't have sin, he's a liar. And, but if we confess our sins, so how do we renew the forgiveness in this question? We if you do make a mistake, don't just shrug and say, oh, well, we all sin. Repent of your sins. Because right. sin, sin hurts the Lord. And we should flee from sin and temptation. 
When you make a mistake, keep short accounts with God. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Give me your Holy Spirit. When David fell, he repented. Read Psalm 51. Read Psalm 32. He said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Rejo restore unto me the joy of your salvation, and then sinners will be converted to you. So if you're going to be a consistent witness, then you need to try to live a godly life. If you fall, ask God forgiveness. He is very merciful. The Bible says his mercy endures for how long? Forever. Forever. And there's a scripture that talks about forgiveness 70 times 7. That's right. And, uh, yeah, which is a kind of a biblical term for being an unlimited number. I don't think God's up there with a ledger saying, all right, you're at 483, because I'd be out then too. Okay. All right. Is there anything I can do to help God save me? Well, that's a sort of a trick question. Um, the sacrifice of Jesus is 100% sufficient for your salvation. So you do not contribute to your salvation by saying, God, you do 90% and I'll do 10. You're, you're saved 100% by his sacrifice. But there is something you need to do. Amen. You must choose to believe in him, to come to him. He will not force you. You know, the great invitation, whosoever believes in him will not perish, but you must believe. Jesus said, come unto me. Jesus invited some people to come and they said, no. Mm -hmm. As a rich young ruler, he said, come follow me. You'll have treasure in heaven. And he turned away sad because he had great possessions. He didn't want to do it. That man will probably perish unless he repented somewhere along the way. There is something you need to do. You need to choose to come just as I am without one plea, right? Amen. So yes, there is something you need to do. All right. When will Christ set up his kingdom on earth? When you talk about the kingdom of Jesus, you're talking about it in stereo. There's two aspects to it. You've got the literal, physical kingdom of Christ that will fill the earth, as it says in Daniel chapter 2. Uh, right now, there's a war going on in this world between good and evil. We're talking about tonight. But there will be a time when uh, Christ, the new Jerusalem, descends. Sin and sinners are no more. All the wicked are cast into the lake of fire. We've got lessons ahead that talk about Revelation 20 and 21. But when Christ came back 2,000 years ago, you know what the first words out of his mouth were? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means within reach. John the Baptist began preaching. He said the same exact thing. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the disciples, before Jesus went to heaven, they said, Lord, will you at this time establish your kingdom? He said, the kingdom of heaven does not come with observation where you say here or there. He said, the kingdom of God is within you. Mm. So the spiritual kingdom of Christ became available with the first coming of Jesus. In fact, even Abraham was saved by faith. When Christ reigns in your heart, the Bible says if he's your Lord, if sin does not have dominion over you, he reigns in your heart. He is your Lord and your Savior. The kingdom of God is wherever you are. But then there's going to be a literal kingdom at the second coming. All right, we have a couple of questions left, but our time is short. Which uh, would you like me to do? Are you picked, dear. Well, you can do number 10. That's good. Okay, we're going to do number 10. When loved ones are reunited in heaven, will they recognize one another? Well, let's, let's just suppose for a minute they don't. Can you really picture saved people up in heaven running around like they've lost their children in a bus station, mm -hmm. saying to the angels, here's this poster, can you put it up? Well, we've misplaced their... <laughs> Of course, you're not going to have that kind of dilemma. Uh, will, first of all, do angels know where our loved ones are? They'll guide us to them. But what if you get in the resurrection and, you know, Grandma, she dies 108 years old, and will she look 108 in heaven? Or is she going to have a new glorified immortal body? Which would probably look a little different. So how are you going to find Grandma? Well, are we going to have less discernment in heaven? More. Or does the Bible say we'll have more? Yeah, and you can read in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, then will I know even as I am known. We're going to have enhanced knowledge. Of course, we're going to know each other. So God, through the Holy Spirit, will be able to recognize who people are. You'll have that, um, instead of just the three dimensions we live in, we'll be living in all the spiritual dimension as well, and we'll be able to identify all our loved ones. All right, well, thank you for those questions. And our topic tonight is the hero of Revelation. Thank you very much, Miss Bachelor. And we're going to go into our study tonight. And again, I want to thank you for uh, joining us. 
for this Prophecy Encounter program. Also want to thank the church in the valley here and all the volunteers. You know, there's a tremendous amount of work that's being done by volunteers here from this church and some other local congregations in Abbotsford that are helping sponsor these meetings. And we really appreciate their commitment. And thank you again for coming. We know we have a lot of friends watching online, but it's so much easier for me if there are warm bodies in the building that I can look at. I get a lot more excited than looking at the glass camera lens. So we thank you for coming. Tonight's study is one of the most important because we're going to be talking about the villain, which of course is the devil. Why is there sin in the world? If God is love, if God is good, if he's all powerful, why would he make a devil? Why is there evil? Why doesn't God stop it? And it's just all these questions. You've heard them come from agnostics and atheists, and the Bible gives the answer to these things. Now, I think one of the keys to understanding these stories in Revelation is found in, uh, or these prophecies, is found in the stories of the Bible. If you look in the Old Testament, you can read in the, um, the second book of Samuel about a young man named Absalom. Actually, it's 1 Samuel. He was a beautiful son of King David. Now, David was inclined to make Solomon his youngest king. Uh, he really loved Bathsheba. And that was Solomon's mother. But uh, he had another son named Absalom. Absalom was actually the fourth out of about ten boys that, uh, that uh, David had. And the Bible says about Absalom that he was one of the most beautiful specimens of humanity that had ever lived. It tells us from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head there was not a blemish in him. He was extremely good looking handsome, and to top things off, what really bothers me, he had hair that just went all the way down <laughs> to his waist. You know, I, I think that uh, God's going to compensate for us when we get to heaven. Those of you who can't sing now, you're going to really sing good in heaven. And those of us who don't have much hair in heaven, are going to have a real do. <laughs> But Absalom, it specifically, it specifically says he's got this, this long hair, this, this beautiful hair, and um, very handsome. He has an argument with his uh, brother Amnon, who was the firstborn. Of course, Amnon mistreats Absalom's sister Tamar. Absalom kills Amnon. He flees the kingdom, but gradually he makes his way back and starts to worm his way back. He wants the kingdom, and he doesn't want to wait for his father to die. And so little by little, Absalom starts to work among the other people and the leaders. Whenever they come to David for judgment, he embraces them and he says, oh, you know, if I was judge, I'd take care of you. And he was so good looking he, and he dressed up and he got 50 men to run before his chariot and everyone said, oh, there goes Absalom. And he started, the Bible uses these phrases, he stole the hearts. You ever heard that expression? It's from the Bible. He stole the hearts of the men of the people of Israel. Finally, it broke into an all-out rebellion, a secret coup where he wanted to overthrow and assassinate his own father. This is David who killed Goliath, the good king. David has to flee Jerusalem. It finally ends in a terrible battle between David's loyal soldiers and all the people that followed Absalom, which was the majority. And guess who wins? You don't want to go to battle against David. He never loses a battle in the Bible. Did you know that? Jesus is the son of David. He never loses a battle. Absalom is slain. It's very interesting. Absalom dies hanging in a tree between heaven and earth. Absalom is the son of David who dies hanging in a tree between heaven and earth. And David prays and says, Oh, Absalom, my son. Absalom, my son, would God I had died for thee. You know, Jesus is the son of David that died as a curse as for sin, for you and me hanging in a tree between heaven and earth. But the picture and the story of Absalom helps us better understand another rebellion that goes back to the very beginning. And it started with Lucifer. Sometimes we know him better as Satan. And that will lead us into our first question for tonight. With whom did sin and evil originate, according to the Bible? And again, I want to remind our friends, we're putting our scriptures on the screen. And I hope you'll be able to take a minute and write these down and you'll also find uh, most of these scriptures and many more in the lessons, the supplemental material that we're providing in connection with the seminar here. Those of you watching online, you can go to BibleUniverse.com and you can find the Amazing Facts study guides there. 
it tells us that he is called the old serpent, called the devil and Satan. And so sin originated with the devil. And again, you can read in 1 John 3, 8, the devil sins from the beginning. The very first sin came from him. You know, have you ever got a cold and you say, well, I caught it from the kids. Where'd they get it? Well, the kids got it from their friends at school. Where'd they get it? Well, they got it from their parents. Where'd they get it? And eventually you're going to say, where'd the first cold come from? It's one of those conundrums, right? A terrible plague of AIDS has swept around the world and it's not as bad in North America now as when we go to Africa. It's terrible still in many African countries and even in India where we were earlier this year and you might want to know who got the first case? Where does this first germ, this mutation come from? And everyone wants to know about evil. If God is good, you read Genesis, when God makes everything, he declares it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. Finally, he says it's very good. The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from God. And so why would there be evil? Where does it come from? Well, it originates with this creature that God made, but he didn't make a devil. He made a beautiful creature. Number two, what was Satan's name before he sinned, and where was he living? This sometimes surprises people. It says in uh, Isaiah 14, by the way, two of the principal Old Testament passages that tell us about the devil is Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. I remember that because two times 14 is 28 and half of 28 is 14. So it kind of helps me. But you're going to find a lot of descriptions we're going to read are from those passages. It says there how you are fallen from heaven. He starts in heaven. Sin started in heaven. I thought heaven was perfect. How you are fallen from heaven. O Lucifer. He wasn't always called the devil. He was a beautiful angel that God had made. Which leads us into our third question. What was the origin of Lucifer and what was his position? You can read in Ezekiel 28. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. Notice something right there. He was born or created? How many people here are created? Most of you, well, you say, I'm a God's creation. Yes, but he creates you through your parents. We're all born. Adam was created. Eve was created. Everyone else has been born. Lucifer was an angel. Angels do not marry. Someone might ask that. Jesus is very clear. Angels do not marry. They do not procreate. They don't have little baby angels called cherubs that fire loving arrows at people. <laughs> And you know, there's a lot of medieval things, but it doesn't say that in the Bible. God created the angels. How long ago? A long time ago. We don't know. What we do know is that the Bible tells us angels are ministering spirits. The Bible also tells us there are good angels and there are bad angels. I'll explain more about that in just a moment. They're in this room now. I know you might think I'm kooky, but I absolutely believe that. You know why? Because the Bible says so. And I believe what the Bible says. God has good angels and there are fallen angels. Lucifer, that's the name we give him before his fall, was the highest of God's angels. Now, angels are glorious creatures. They're powerful. And this may have been one of the first creations of God, this leading, splendid, glorious, beautiful creation of God. And he was perfect when he was made. God did not make a devil. God did not say, you know, it's getting kind of boring having everybody love me and be good. I'm, I'm going to make a devil just to see what happens. God didn't do that. But what God did is he made his creatures free. You were perfect from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. It was something that was done by choice. You were the anointed cherub who covers. For I establish you. Now, some of you know a little bit about the, um, the temple of God and the Holy of Holies, that inner sanctum. And there was the Ark of the Covenant that had the Ten Commandments. And on top of the Ark, they called it the Mercy Seat. There were two golden angels. That's all like an earthly representation of the throne of God in heaven. You read in Isaiah chapter 6 that Isaiah sees God on his throne and there's a seraphim on the right and one on the left and they're crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And we believe that Lucifer held a position right by the side of the Lord as one of these anointed cherubs, these chosen cherubs. Many believe Gabriel is the other. He's not fallen. But this powerful angel began to rebel against God, and sin started in his heart. 
And we'll talk about how that unfolded. But first thing I need to explain is it tells us he was perfect. The Bible tells us he was beautiful. Uh, people, when they talk about the devil, they think it's a joke. And a lot of people think the devil is a mythological character. Uh, but let me ask you a question. If I, before you saw that picture up there, <clears throat> if I were to ask you to close your eyes for a moment, it's not a good exercise, but if I were to say picture the devil, what do people typically see? They see uh, somebody, what's on top of his head? Horns. Horns, there you go. And what's he got in his hand? Horns. A pitchfork or a trident. He has like Neptune's trident. And, and uh, what color is he wearing? Red leotards. And he's got like bat wings. You've ever seen that rendition before? He's got like, and does he have a beard? So he's got a goatee. Yeah, I know all the pictures I've seen of the devil, the paintings. And you know, if someone will advertise, you know, red devil paint or devil's food cake, of course you got angel's food cake too. But um, uh, I used to have a beard. And uh, when I was younger, my beard was actually dark. And people said, Pastor Doug, you know, I grew a beard when no men were growing beards. Now all the men are growing beards. But I grew a beard back, you know, when pastors didn't. I was the only pastor in Northern California with a beard back then. And someone said, you look like a sinister minister. <laughs> so, so I shaved it off. Now, when I grow it, it's all gray. But uh, so he's got, you know, the, and he's some kind of a ghoulish creature. They make him look like, you know, some kind of troll or something. And, and he's, you know, fierce and ugly and scary. And, but what does the Bible say about him? The exact opposite. He was a beautiful creature, a glorious creature. He wants people to think that he looks like that image. So what led Lucifer to sin? You read about it again. You go to Ezekiel 28, verse 17. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You've corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. Now, have you ever known somebody that was beautiful, but the problem was they knew they were beautiful? <laughs> and they become vain and proud and sort of preoccupied with themselves. And, you know, a lot of young men would like to have a trophy wife. And I remember two guys were sitting in church one day and another guy walked in. He had one of these beautiful wives and all the guys stopped and looked. And one guy said to the other, that guy's wife always looks like a million dollars. And his friend said, yeah, and he's paying about a million dollars a year to keep her looking that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they think, oh, if I could just be more beautiful. But sometimes when people are preoccupied with that, you know, I knew a girl, she was very pretty, problem she knew it, and just, oh, she's always reading Glamour magazine, she couldn't walk by a store window without just checking herself, you know, and primping all the time, and, and it's like, it's almost like self-worship. I heard a pastor say one time, there's four kinds of people, and he put it this way. He said, you got people that are ugly beautiful. So what I mean by that is they may be homely on the outside, but they're beautiful on the inside. They got a winning disposition, and they're kind, and they're friendly, he said, and then you've got people who are beautiful, ugly. They're beautiful on the outside, but they're so preoccupied with their beauty that they just consume with looking at themselves. He said, and then you've got people who are very rare and special. They are called the beautiful, beautiful. And the Bible talks about uh, a beautiful woman without discretion is like a jewel of gold in a pig's nose. Did you ever hear Solomon say that? It's in the Bible. You check it out. Uh, but if you get one that is beautiful with discretion, that's like Proverbs 31. You've got that, that woman or husband rises up in her family to praise her. And then the fourth is, of course, nobody wants to be the fourth category, which is ugly, ugly. So, but uh, you should all want to be at least beautiful on the inside, right? Well, the devil was preoccupied with his beauty, and he, he started to resent that the creatures were worshiping God more than him. You read on here. And you read a lot more about this in Isaiah 14. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. Someone said Lucifer had eye problems. It was all I, 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 I. I've heard it said that um, people that struggle with mental illness use the words I, me, my, mine, and myself five times more than people that are sane. Selfishness is a form of insanity, and all sin springs 
from some form of selfishness. God is what? God is love. The devil is the complete opposite of that. He is selfishness. And he began to resent that he was not God. He was so beautiful and so powerful and so glorious, he thought, you know, I'm only this far from being totally God. Maybe I can take it by force. I know that sounds crazy to you and I, but somehow he thought he could overcome his creator. He's that powerful. He deceived himself, and he thought, you know, if I could get the support of all the other angels, if I could get their worship, we could lead a rebellion against God, drive him away, and I could rule. I don't know what he was thinking. But he began to sow discord among the other angels because of his pride. And he started saying, you know, God's rules are per they're very restrictive, and why do we have to worship him supremely? And, and just through very clever innuendo and placing doubts, he was able to sow discord very effectively. And he still does today. You notice it says in Proverbs 6, 16, six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to run into evil, and notice, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. And that's what Lucifer began to do, to sow discord among the angels in heaven. And it eventually broke out into an all-out rebellion. Fifth question here. What happened in heaven as a consequence of Lucifer's rebellion? You can read in Revelation 12, and a lot of what we're studying today is from Revelation 12. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon, who's the dragon? The dragon's a symbolic word for the devil. And some people might be surprised, but Michael is an Old Testament term for Christ before the incarnation. The Bible says the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel. The Lord, the greatest messenger, tells us that Jude, in the book of Jude, verse 9, that Michael comes to resurrect Moses and that Joshua takes his shoes off and he bows in the book of Joshua to worship the angel of the Lord who is like the Lord. It's Michael. The, and that, this is one of the pre-incarnate names for Christ. Just like the dragon is a symbolic name, Michael is a symbolic name. Jesus is not an angel. Jesus is the Son of God, God himself. He's uh, the second person of the Godhead. But um, So it, it gives us this picture of a battle between the angels that were loyal to Christ against the angels that were loyal to Lucifer. And finally, and you, I don't know what kind of weapons angels use, we probably can't comprehend it, but the Bible tells us sometimes angels hold swords. An angel stopped Balaam with a sword. David saw an angel with a drawn sword over Jerusalem. And so um, we don't know exactly what their weapons were. You can read in Ezekiel 9 about these weapon angels have destroying weapons. I don't know what they are. But some kind of battle broke out in heaven. And the angels that were loyal to God, and the Bible tells us what the percentages were. Two-thirds of the angels, now these are billions because there's guardian angels for every person. There's at least billions. Two-thirds of them remained loyal to God. One-third rebelled. Lucifer was so convincing, he persuaded one-third of the angels to trust him more than God. And you'll see he was able to do that in our world as well. So, some of you might be wondering, why did God just cast Lucifer out of heaven at that point? When Lucifer rebelled, why didn't God just say, hey, look, I'm God. You're a creature. I brought you into this universe. I can take you out. You ever heard that before? Any of you ever have your parents tell you that? <laughs> you just, I brought you into this world. I can take you out. <laughs> but um, God could have done that, right? Sure, could God have snapped his fingers and destroyed Lucifer? Yeah. Why didn't he? What would have happened if he did? The other angels, I mean, God could have said, oh, Lucifer, you, you've got a complaint. He could have just pointed his finger. Lightning could have flashed from every direction. There could have been a smoldering dark spot where Lucifer once stood, and the other angels would go, oh, better listen to God. Look what he does if you don't. And they would obey because they love God, or because they're afraid of God. God does not want his creatures to obey because he's going to smite them with lightning if they don't obey. How many of you have disobeyed the Lord and he didn't hit you with lightning right away? 
You know, there's a proverb. It says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. Because God is so merciful and patient, and we don't get struck with lightning or some calamity every time we sin, we think, oh, nothing happened. And so we become more ingrained in our bad behavior. But God wants you to obey because he's a loving God, and what he's asking is reasonable. Now, does that mean then that if Lucifer went bad, God must have done something wrong. I mean, isn't God the one in charge of the factory? When he's making angels, you know, and they're doing quality control, somebody missed something. And this angel came off the conveyor belt, and there were some burnt transistors, and he decided to be selfish. If God had made him better, that never would have happened. Isn't that what people think? God must have wired him wrong. Didn't God, doesn't he know all things? Why would he make an angel that would rebel? Uh, you know, I always like to do this illustration. Let me see if it'll help a little bit. You know, I get all these million-dollar ideas, but I never do anything about them. And uh, I'll have Karen tell you one night about my elephant ears. I developed a hearing aid without any batteries. It's really great. Of course, they look like big elephant ears, but it works. All right, I've developed an app now. How many of you want to be loved? How many of us want love? Of course, we all want love. I like to be liked. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing fine, smartphone. I'm doing splendid. My right. batteries are fully charged. Wait a second. I was, let me, let's start this over again here. <laughs> That's the problem with computers here. All right, here. All right, so I, I developed this app because I want love. And uh, so I found a way. This is going to make a lot of money. Hello, Doug. Hello, smartphone. How are you doing? This evening. I'm doing fine. How are you doing? I'm doing splendid. My batteries are fully charged. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. Doug, I need to tell you something. We're all listening. I love you, Doug. Oh. No, really, I do. You are so kind and so thoughtful and you're so intelligent and you're so witty and tall and dark and handsome. I love you, Doug. You are wonderful. I love you, Doug. You are magnificent. I love you, Doug. You are terrific. I love you, Doug. I love you. I love you. I feel so much better. Isn't it? Don't you think we're going to make a lot of money on this new app? I love you app. And you know what you do? You make check boxes, and you can just check, say, smart, good looking. You just say, it'll tell you whatever you want it to tell you. And you won't have to get married. You can, you can just get the app, and you get all the love you want. Will it work? You don't think that's going to sell? Oh, man, I thought that was a great idea. <laughs> you know why it won't work? That's not love, is it? Can you program love? If I force my phone to tell me it loves me, is it love? Could God have made his creatures and say, I'm just going to make sure they all love me. I love you, God. I love you, God. I love you. Is that love? So the only way to get real love is to take the risk that someone may not love you. It must be freely given by choice in an independent evaluation. That's the only way you can really have love. Forced love, sometimes called rape, that's not love. God is not going to force us to love him. The ultimate proof that you are free to choose to love God is because there's evil in the world, meaning that someone along the way chose not to love God, to love themselves instead. And of course, self-love ends up being self-destruction. God said real happiness comes from giving love and making giving first. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. And the way to get love is to give love. And I've found that uh, happy wife, happy life. If I make Karen happy, she makes me happy. It comes through giving love is how you receive love. Isn't that how it works? And that's how it is with God. We, we choose to love him. You can't force love. So if God, God didn't make a mistake. He made all his creatures. Did he know what was going to happen? Yes. He didn't want it to happen. But because he makes his creatures free and intelligent, he lets them make the choice. Lucifer chose to put himself first. God could have destroyed him, but he didn't. 
because he doesn't want us to love him out of fear. He wants us to love him because of who he is, because what he's asking is reasonable. Does that make sense? All right, let's move along here. We've got still several more, more points to cover. Where is Satan's present headquarters now? Where does he abide? You read in Revelation 12, verse 4, his tail drew a third. How many? A third of the stars. These stars are called angels. And threw them to the earth. You read in Revelation chapter 1 that the stars are angels. So I'm not guessing at that. Threw them where? To the earth. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. Notice there it says, dragon, Satan, devil, serpent. Gives us four categories, ways that he's identified biblically, and you'll find all these terms. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast. To, there you have it. Third of the stars, and what does it call them? His angels were cast out with him. So when people talk about ghosts and goblins and, and um, you know, all these imps and different evil creatures and things, they're all fallen angels. It's just they're fallen angels that are tempting and causing problems. <laughs> You know, who was it? Flip Wilson, the comedian that used to say, the devil made me do it. Devil doesn't make you do it. It's usually the devil working through fallen angels that tempt us. The devil is not omnipresent. He was cast to the earth. You can read in Job 1.7. There's a meeting, a heavenly meeting. It says, the Lord says to Satan, where did you come from? And he said to the Lord, I've come from going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down in it. And even Jesus calls the devil the prince of this world. And so Satan has set up his headquarters down here. You might be wondering why. Because when he first tempted Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve chose to listen to the devil instead of God, the Bible says whoever you obey, that's whose servants you are. The devil moved his beachhead operation against God to this planet where he found some followers. All right, you go to number seven. It says, when God, uh, when God created Adam and Eve, what one thing did he forbid them to do? You remember the story there from Genesis chapter two? God said, you're free to eat from all the trees in the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. So God said, do not eat it, you will die. Well, but then someone appears to Eve and he disagrees with the word of God. What medium did Satan use to deceive Eve? And what lies did Satan tell her? Remember what the medium was? It says, now the serpent. Now, does the snake scare you? Some of you? I think they're kind of cool. I mean, <laughs> just, I used to catch them, but uh, the snakes aren't any more evil than, you know, a guinea pig. Uh, they're just, it's a creature that became a symbol for something. You'll see why. But it tells us a serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Some believe at one point that the serpent uh, had the ability to fly. I'll explain that in a moment. And the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Eve was doing her work in the garden. She was getting close to the forbidden tree. And she heard a voice call out to her. And she said, oh, I didn't know anybody talked in this world other than Adam and I. And here the serpent is speaking and he's eating the forbidden fruit. And she's going, Wow. And the serpent said, oh, yeah, I got this ability from this fruit. Did God tell you you're not allowed to eat from all the trees? Well, yeah, God said that we're... He said, oh, you're not going to die. Look what happened to me. God's trying to hide something from you. He's afraid you're going to become God too. I'm paraphrasing. But this is what the devil wanted. He wanted to be God. And he planted his own desires in the mind and heart of Eve. Oh, but if you eat this, you'll have supernatural abilities. Look at me, I'm talking. And she remonstrated with him. Oh, no, God said we're going to die. No, you won't die. The devil still tells people that. The penalty for sin is what? The wages of sin are death. The Bible tells us you've got two choices. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. You get life or death, those are the choices. Moses, before he died, he gathered Israel together. He said, I set before you this day two options. Life and good and blessing, death and evil and cursing. Choose life. And so she had to make a decision. Am I going to believe the word of God or the word of the enemy? First question in the Bible is the devil questioning the word of God. <clears throat> and so much of the sin and problems in the world today come because of people doubting the word of God. 
So you read in Revelation 12, verse 9, that dragon was cast out, that old serpent, <clears throat> excuse me, called the devil and Satan, and he's cast out where? He comes to the earth because he's found people down here to listen to him. The Bible tells us then, we read this to you last night, God says there's going to be a battle in this world between good and evil. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. You know, just a little amazing fact I thought I'd throw in real quick. Um, around the world, there are legends of flying serpents. How many of you have heard some of these? Flying dragons, flying serpents. There is actually a snake. Here's a picture of one in Indonesia. It jumps from tree to tree. It flattens out its rib cage, and it will kind of swim, glide through the air. It doesn't really fly, but it's pretty amazing. It does really glide through the air and grab onto another tree or on the limbs. Evidently, after the devil used the serpent as a medium, it says, from now on, you're going to go on your belly, meaning prior to the curse, he wasn't going on his belly. And it's possible that they flew. It is also interesting that around the world, you do find bones of uh, what they call pterodactyls, pterodactyls, petrosaurs, flying reptiles. One of them was as big as a Cessna plane. And I believe these creatures really did live. And so there may have been some flying reptiles that lived long ago and, and uh, they suffered from the curse. Now, you, th you think about the serpent and the woman in this battle with the seed of the woman. Then you go to Revelation and when you read at the end of Revelation 17, the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he goes to make war with the remnant of her offspring, her seed, who do what? They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Through the Bible, you see this enmity, this war going on between God and the devil, and it's being fought here in this world. You know where the war, you know where the battlefield is for this war? It's between your ears. All of the suffering and problems you see in the world today, it's largely happening in the, mar in the minds and the hearts of people. How many of you have felt that battle? The Bible calls it a battle between the spirit and the flesh. Now it's even, it's found out into nature. After Adam and Eve sinned, even nature went haywire. Animals didn't eat each other in the Garden of Eden. The Bible says in heaven, the lions will eat straw like the ox. And there's not going to be any death anymore. But the thorns and the thistles came out. The whole creation now groans and travails. Everything was changed by sin and when the devil kind of came in and, and claimed this world. And so you see this battle going on. You know, in the Bible it tells us in Mark 16, they will take up serpents. And some people misunderstand that verse and they think that means you're supposed to go hunting snakes to prove you got the Holy Spirit. Have you heard about this? Some churches, they're called snake handlers. Uh, Jesus said that because you have to read what he says in Luke chapter 10, verse 18. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample, to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will by any means hurt you. It's true. Paul got bit by a venomous serpent. Nothing happened to him. But it especially means that with the power of Christ, we will be able to combat the devil. It's not talking about trampling on people. It's talking about fighting the power of the enemy because there is a war going on between good and evil. Jesus told us, he said, be you wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You have, have you heard that verse before? It doesn't mean be like a devil. It says sometimes you've got to realize what the plans of the devil are. Now, I'm always reluctant to take a night and talk about the devil. You don't want to give him glory, but you need to understand what the Bible says about the enemy because most of us deal with it every day. We're going to talk about how you can have victory over the power of the enemy. Well, why was eating this one piece of forbidden fruit such a deadly offense? I've got another little amazing fact for you. Around Florida and in the Caribbean, they've got a tree called the Mac McNeil tree. And it's considered, according to Guinness Book of World Records, the deadliest tree in the world. Um, Columbus called them death apples. If you should, they look like little crab apples, but if you should pull one of those off a tree and take a bite, uh, you, good chance you'll die. If not, you'll go through excruciating suffering and you may never fully recover. It can cause all kinds of organ damage, throat swells up. Matter of fact, if you are under one of these trees when it's raining, when the drops run off the leaves on your skin, it can blister you. It's an extremely toxic tree, but it's deceptive because some people bite it and when you first bite the fruit, 
people who have survived said it was sweet and almost had a peppery flavor and it was great at first and then it begins to the poison takes effect it begins to swell and spread and and it can cause all kinds of uh, internal damage how bad can eating a piece of fruit be well when God says don't eat this fruit he means don't eat the fruit the main thing wasn't the fruit the main thing was the disobedience the Bible says in Romans 6, 16, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the slaves of the one you obey, whether sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? When Adam and Eve chose to listen to the word of the devil instead of the word of God, God had given Adam and Eve dominion of the planet. They were the stewards of this new world, and they basically handed the keys to the devil. The devil had the right then to set up his headquarters here on earth to continue his battle against God. So what are some of Satan's strategies and his methods he uses to discourage and destroy people? Let's talk about his tactics so that we're not easily taken by them. I'm going to go through a number here. First of all, Satan deceives the whole world. He is a deceiver. What is deception? Deception is especially dangerous because it's the commingling of truth and error. You see, the devil, in a sense, has an advantage over God. In the devil, he can tell a lie, but he can tell the truth and mix in a little bit of lie, which makes him dangerous. So if I give you a bottle that is 99% pure, fresh grape juice and it's just got 1% poison in it, it'll still kill you. And what the devil does is he finds a lot of good things. And a lot of people say, you know, there's a lot of good things in that religion, but they, they miss the poison. And so the devil is a master at deceiving, and the Bible says he doesn't deceive a few. How many does he deceive? The whole world. Most of the world is deceived by the devil. Furthermore, he's a tempter. The Bible went in the wilderness. The Bible says Jesus went into the wilderness where he was tempted of the devil for 40 days. Uh, if Christ was tempted, then would you be surprised that you and I are tempted? Tempted means God it tells us what his will is. The devil tries to get us to disobey and do something that we know is wrong. And so people are struggling with these moral dilemmas every day. The devil is often tempting us to disobey and try to separate us from the power of God and the blessings of God. Uh, the devil is a deceiver. You can read in Revelation 16, he can work miracles. Revelation 16, 14, they are the spirits of devils working miracles. Does the devil have power to work miracles? So if you see a pastor and he says, look, I can do signs and wonders, that must mean what I'm saying is true. Are signs and wonders proof? Or can the devil counterfeit signs and wonders? When Moses went before the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh said, what proof do you have you're from God? Moses threw down his staff and it turned into a serpent. And the Pharaoh clapped his hands and his magicians came out and threw down their rods and they became serpents. Matter of fact, the Pharaoh's magicians were able to replicate several of the plagues until it came to the lice. They said, we can't make lice. But uh, the devil can counterfeit miracles. You can read in Revelation chapter 13, verse 13. It says, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven in the sight of men to deceive them. You can read in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. The devil knows how to make himself look like a preacher of righteousness, but Paul says they are ministers of wickedness. Uh, we've seen in history before where we've heard pastors and preachers and they seem to be doing wonderful things and then all of a sudden the veil is pulled aside and we find out their lives were a big lie and they were raking in money and they were robbing people or doing terrible immoral things. And so the devil often works. Jesus put it this way, Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets that come to you in sheep's clothing. Inwardly they are ravening wolves. So how do you know Pastor Doug's not one of those? How do you know what I'm saying is true or, or not? What am I putting on the screen every night? One or two scriptures? Three or four? Or maybe more like 60 or 70? And I've, then we're putting them in your hands when you walk out the door. And we're saying, you search for yourself. You see if what I'm saying is true or not. I don't want you to believe me. I don't want your blood on my hands. I want you to believe the word. Because how are you going to prevent being deceived? There's so many false prophets out there. And there's a lot of false shepherds. And the devil, 
The devil doesn't mind you're going to church. The devil doesn't mind you're claiming to be a Christian. He'd love for you to be self-deceived into thinking you're saved when you're not. What did Jesus say in the last days? Many will come to me saying, Lord, Lord. And he'll say, I don't know you. Depart from me, ye who work iniquity. But Lord, we went to church. We knew your name. We sang about you. We did many wonderful works. And he'll say, I don't know you. And the Lord says, many will come to me in that day. How do you know you're not one of those many? It's not enough to just say, oh yeah, I'm religious. You need to really know what the truth is and be surrendered to the Lord based on what? What Pastor Doug says or what the Word says? You've got to know your, the Word for yourself. How did Jesus fight temptation? With the Word. We'll get to that in a minute. False prophets. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Revelation 12 says the devil is an accuser. You know the story of Job. He stood there and he accused Job before God. Oh, he only believes you because you bless him. If you take away his stuff, he'll curse you. If you hurt his body, he'll curse you. You read in Zechariah chapter 3, the devil's there pointing to the priest, pointing at his dirty garments. The devil's always the accuser of the brethren. Uh, Judas, when Mary was washing Jesus' feet, Judas said, oh, what a terrible waste of money, and this should have been given to the poor. That was the devil, always finding fault and gossiping, and yeah, that even happens in the church sometimes. Doesn't the, does the devil come to even the true church sometimes to try to deceive? Did Jesus have a Judas in his church? Yeah, so we need to know what the word says. Furthermore, John 8, 44, he is a murderer from the beginning and he is a liar and the father of it. So the devil, first murder, he inspired Cain to kill his brother. If the devil could, he'd pull Jesus right off his throne and kill him. Look at the cross. Did the devil want to kill Jesus? Because of his badness or because of his goodness? The devil wanted to kill Jesus because of Jesus' goodness. And so he's just cold-hearted. You know, a serpent, uh, many animals, they have young, and they nurture them, and they feed them, and they take care of them. But a serpent will have its babies. It just crawls away. It says, okay, you guys are on your own. They're cold-blooded. The devil is cold-blooded. He is a calculating liar. The principal thing the devil worships is himself. He doesn't care at all costs. He only thinks, how will this look for me? And some people who follow him take up the same motives. How powerful and effective will Satan's temptations be in the last days and his strategies? Matthew 24, 24, the Bible says, there will be false Christs and false prophets that will rise and show great signs and wonders and deceive many. Even if it were possible, who would be deceived? The very elect. What will prevent God's people from being deceived in the last days? Isaiah chapter 8 says, according to the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, the word of God, there's no light in them. So how are we going to know if Satan comes to impersonate Jesus who the real Jesus is? Well, for one thing, the Bible tells us how Christ is coming. Is he going to be walking around on the earth or is he going to be up in heaven? The Bible tells us, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour. If you're going through lion country, would you keep your eyes open? Yeah. And Karen and I, Pastor Ross, were in South Africa. Did you know Karen was attacked by a lion? Yeah, a lion was about that big. But it, <laughs> it's still fun to get a reaction. He was bigger than that. He was, he bit her. He did. We went, they put us in a lion cage with little baby lions, and we were videotaping, and, uh, and the lion nearly carried off my wife. He was a little lion. But it's fun to say she was attacked by a lion. Not everybody can say that. But when we're going through lion country, you want to keep your eyes open, right? And Peter's telling us the devil is looking. How do you do that? Jesus said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. How do you watch and pray? Do you begin your day with God? Do you commit yourself to God every day? Are you supposed to pray once a week when you go to church? Doesn't Jesus say in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread? That means his prayer is something you do daily. Morning, evening, and at noon will I pray, King David said, Psalm chapter um, 55, 17. Did, uh, Daniel, as his custom was, three times a day he prayed. 
We ought to set aside time every day to commit ourselves to the Lord through prayer and read his word. The Bible says, Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin. So there are three principal areas where people are tempted. Isn't that good to know? There's only three areas, so don't worry. It has a thousand. It all falls into one of three areas. It's called the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are the same three areas where the devil met Jesus in the wilderness with a terrible temptation. You can read first temptation he brings, Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. He said, if you're the son of God, command that these stones become bread. And he was hungry. He hadn't eaten for 40 days. So it was a physical temptation. So many temptations have to do with the physical needs. And it could be food. It could be sex. It could be something like that. So it could be drugs, an addiction like alcohol. That's a physical temptation, a craving. And what did Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You notice what Jesus did to fight temptation? He always turned to the Scripture. Jesus had the Word of God and the promises of God that gave him strength against temptation. It works for you the same way. Then the devil took him up to the holy city and he sets him up on a pinnacle of the temple. And he says to him, cast yourself down. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself, for it is written. And the devil says, oh, we're going to use the Bible. I can quote the Bible. The devil's quoting the Bible. Throw yourself down. It is written. He'll give his angels charge over you. But he didn't read the whole thing. And Jesus knew he misquoted Psalm 91. And Jesus said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. You're not supposed to be jumping off the buildings and asking God to catch you. Or similar things. Where we're, we're, temp we're, we're falling into sin and we're asking God to prove he's God by catching us. Finally, he takes Jesus up onto an exceedingly high mountain. Shows him all the kingdoms of the world and all of their glory. And the devil says, Jesus, you don't need to die for the sins of the world. If you just fall down and worship me, I'll give all this to you. I'm the prince of this world. Even Jesus calls the devil the prince of this world. Just worship me. That's all I want is you to worship me, declare that I am God. And what did Jesus say? Get behind me, away from me, Satan, for it is written. He quotes the Bible again. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So all three times when Jesus was tempted, he met temptation with, it is written, it is written, it is written. So how do we fight the temptations of the Bible? How do you get darkness out of a room? I'm sorry, how do you find the temptations? That's why she sits up front. She catches these things. How do you fight the temptations of the devil? You have God's word in your heart. How do you get darkness out of a room? Turn on the light. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. As you read the word, it does bring light and illumination into your life and your heart, and it drives the darkness out. Some of you struggle with depression and, and just uh, an oppression, and you'd find the word of God can bring you joy. God's word gives us peace. It says, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing will offend them. And he wants you to have that peace. But it comes through inviting him in. If Christ is in you, you don't need to be afraid of the devil. You can read in Ephesians 6, 11, put on the armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. God supplies armor in his word through faith and the gospel. The Bible tells us that the, the word of God itself is a weapon. You can read in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And again, you can read about that in Hebrews 4. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so how do we fight the enemy? How did Jesus fight the enemy? If the Son of God needed the, the Scriptures to fight temptation, how do you and I think we're going to make it by ignoring the Scriptures? Some of us think, well, Pastor Doug, I've got a Bible. That's great. And I even keep it right next to my bed. That's good. That's like people saying, and I, and I wear a cross. It's like a good luck charm. The, the Bible doesn't ever say to own a Bible. Read the Bible. It's not wear the cross. It's bear the cross. They're very different. We think that somehow the, we get these like superstitious ideas for how we're supposed to fight the devil. You need the word in you. Amen? Amen. A regular habit. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There is sometimes an effort. First, you submit to God. 
Christ comes in your heart, resist temptation and he will flee. A lot of us give up so quickly. If you'd find, if you resist through prayer, that God will give you strength and the devil gets frustrated and he leaves. He came to the devil with three temptations. Jesus resisted and it says the devil left him. You can do what Christ did and he will leave you and you'll go, ha, peace, at least for a while, till the next battle. Submit to God. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He'll give you strength. And then I love this promise. 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Keep in mind, there are two good angels for every bad angel. So God will empty heaven, providing you with help, rather than see you overcome when you're trusting in him. God, uh, he, David doesn't lose battles. Jesus does not lose battles. If you turn to him and you stand with Christ, you have nothing to fear. Why? Greater is he that is in you. How much greater? Infinitely greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So when and where will the devil receive his final punishment? You can read about this in Matthew 25. Christ will declare to the devil and the lost, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It says in Ezekiel 28, I will bring you to ashes on the earth in the sight of those that behold you. What is it that forever settles the horrible problem of sin? And then will sin ever rise up again? How do we know after... God creates a new heaven and a new earth that someone else won't decide to worship themselves and rebel against God. There's a promise in the book of Nahum, chapter 1, verse 9. It's a short prophecy, but he makes a promise, affliction will not rise up the second time. Do you know what's going to prevent that? All through eternity, we're going to see the scars in Christ's hands. We're going to know what was the price and what was the cost for sin. You can read in Zechariah 13, it says, And one said unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? When Jesus rose from the dead, did he still have the scars in his hands? I know a song that uh, I sing when I'm alone. And uh, it says, The only thing in heaven made by man are the scars in the Savior's hands. And when we see what Jesus paid because of rebellion and sin, no one will ever doubt his love again. We will all be discouraged from ever wanting to exalt ourselves and to, to turn the arrow around to self-love. Who makes the final complete eradication of sin from the universe a certainty? 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to destroy the terrible thing that, Je that the devil did to this world. For as much then as um, the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same, that through death he might destroy him that has the power of death, that is the devil. Christ became one of us to show us his love for us, to show us what the Father is like, to show us how to live, and to die in our place. When Jesus died on the cross, it really was the death knell for the devil. Christ said, it is finished. He completely paid the sacrifice. He disproved the claims of the devil. There at the cross, you see a great contest is being decided. You see the devil's love for power, and you see Christ's power of love at the cross. You got the devil inspiring the mob. Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate says, he hasn't done anything wrong. Crucify him. And then you hear Jesus say, Father, forgive them. You've got the two big motives in the universe right there. You've got the love of God and the selfishness of the devil. And all of us, there's only two masters. I, I, don't, I wish I could tell you you've got a lot of options, friends, but you don't. Jesus said, you're either with me or against me. There are only two roads. There's the broad road to destruction, and there's the straight, narrow gate to eternal life. And... The Lord is giving you the same freedom he gives every intelligent creature. You're made in his image. He's not going to force you to love him. You must choose. You can come to him. How does God the Father feel about people? It's not only that Jesus loves us, but Jesus said the Father loves us. God the Father so loved the world that he gave his son. You all know John 3, 16. That whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. He's offering that to you. He wants you to have that. And if we repent, as it says in Ezekiel, from
from all of our transgressions. He says, turn, turn. Why will you die? Cast away from yourself these, uh, the sins and the things that drag us down. The Lord wants you to have a new life. God says, notice this, Ezekiel 18.30. He says, I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord. Therefore, turn and live. Jesus began his ministry. He said, repent, that means turn. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, if the kingdom of heaven was at hand 2,000 years ago, is the kingdom of heaven at hand for you today? It is. If you just turn to Jesus with your heart, and you say, Lord, I want, I want you in my life. I want you to give me power to live a new life, to resist what the devil is doing in my life, and then through faith believe that he can and he will. How do you know that? He's proven it because he paid so much to make it possible. I have a story I like to share sometimes when I do this presentation. True story. In Florida, I used to live in Miami, but in northern Florida, they um, had some problems around Orlando with alligators. They've just been proliferating and getting into some of the, the lakes and the, even the private areas. Some of you heard about an alligator that took a little girl near Disney World. And um, this one mother, she lived with a lake right out their back window, and she could see it from the kitchen. And periodically, her boy would want to go out and go swimming. But she was always watching from the window when he went out swimming in the lake. And this one day, she was doing dishes. He said, I want to go. A hot summer day. She wanted to go out and jump in the water. He jumped out and went and swam towards the middle of the pond. And she saw, just in a flash, she saw the splash of an alligator tail on the other side of the lake. And she knew she saw that wake of it coming towards her son. She dropped what she was doing. She ran out, and she's yelling, quick run, swim, swim back to the, the shore. That alligator is coming. There's an alligator. He heard his mother. He looked around. He didn't see it, but he believed her, and he began to swim as quick as he could back to his mother. Mother was coming down into the water to meet him, and the alligator was gaining. And right at the time the boy got his first foot on the muddy bottom of the lake, the alligator got a hold of his legs. The mother then was in the water, and she got a hold of his hands. And then there ensued a terrific splashing struggle tug of war. This large alligator was pulling the boy back down in the water because what they want to do is they want to get you in the water, they spin around, they drown you. The mother was pulling for all that she could. At one point, she, her son slipped out of her hands. She jumped back in and went in further and grabbed him again and kept pulling. He's saying, don't let go. And he's screaming as the alligator's got his legs. And neighbor next door was a farmer an orange orchard and had a rifle in his truck. He heard the commotion. He saw right away he knew what was going on. He grabbed his rifle, went down, and he shot the alligator. Well, the boy was taken to the hospital and he just had a lot of stitches in his legs. And after he recovered for a couple of days, people in the community heard the story and a reporter went by. He wanted to get the firsthand account from the boy with the parent's permission. And he told the whole story I just related to you. And the reporter said, can I see your legs? And he pulled up the bed and he showed him where all the stitches were. And he, he was going to be okay, but he had some pretty good scars on his legs. And, and the boy said, do you want to see the scars on my arms? And he pulled back his hospital pajamas and he showed the scars on his arms. He said, I've got these scars too because my mother wouldn't let go of me. <laughs> and you know, Jesus has scars because he didn't want to let go of you. Amen. And so if you wonder does the Lord want to save me? He's desperate to save you, but he will never force you because he wants your love. And that's something you must freely give. And if you're waiting for circumstances to be perfect for you to surrender to the Lord, the devil will see to it. It's never convenient. You know what the best time is to listen to God? When he's speaking to you through his spirit. The best time to choose to obey God is when you know his will. And I believe the Lord brought you and some who are watching because he knows that you need salvation. He knows that you need a new beginning. You need freedom from the enemy. And tonight, it's as simple as coming and saying, Lord, I'm helpless without you. There's nothing I can do. I can't resist temptation. I can't fight. But I believe that through Christ, I can do all things. That's the promise in the Bible. And if you'd like that power and you'd like that freedom, I'd like to pray with you tonight. Is that your desire, friends? Matter of fact, could we stand in his presence as we close our meeting with prayer. Father, 
Lord, we, we see the suffering and the misery in the world, and it's easy to believe there's an evil power out there. But we also see that there's so much love and there's so much good, and we know that you are real. We see this battle between these two titanic forces, Lord, and we want you to be victorious in our lives. We want to be in that kingdom where there is no longer sin or death or suffering or any evil. Lord, the only way for us to be on the winning team is to accept your son. You promise that if we believe in him, we will not perish but have everlasting life. Tonight we want to come. We believe. We invite Jesus to be our Lord and our Savior, our King. Please come into our hearts. We are sorry. We repent of our sins. Give us power to be new creatures. Lord, I pray that you can help us to experience that new, be, new birth as we pray right now. And if there are any that are here in this building or those who may be watching, I pray that they'll pray and say right now, Lord Jesus, forgive my sins. Come into my heart. Save me. Do for me and in me what I cannot do for myself. And help me live a new life for you. Be your witness and be ready for your return. We thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer because we're praying in the worthy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, I pray that you've prayed that prayer, and I pray you'll talk to him every day now and ask him to fill your heart. Amen? Amen. When's our next meeting? Tomorrow, we're going to talk about the law of the Lamb. We hope that you'll come. Thank you for coming, and bring your friends and enemies. God bless you, and have a good night.